Well, hello. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person, um, but I hope that uh, you will be able to uh, follow this uh, talk about vulval disease um, and that it will be useful to you. So when we uh, talk about patients with vulval disease, they can present in different ways. Uh, they may complain of itch, pain or soreness. And then there are multiple different diagnoses and different fields uh, in the area of vulval disease that we then uh, can fit into these uh, patterns. Um, and that is, is a wide area. Um, and uh, for those of you that may be not so familiar with dealing with patients with vulval disease, I'm going to try and make this uh, a practical approach that should be helpful. So the way that we will look at this is um, patients who have no symptoms, but are worried because they can see something that they feel is abnormal on the vulva. Those who have symptoms, but have nothing to see. Um, and then lastly, patients who have symptoms uh, where there is something to see. So patients uh, sometimes will be completely asymptomatic, but will have seen something when they may have self-examined uh, that they get concerned about. Um, and a lot of this is just normal variants. So it's important that you are familiar with these. Uh, this is a patient uh, with a, a rather prominent heart line. You can see uh, this redness inside, but this is just the normal vestibular mucosa. And heart line is the junction of mucosa that is non-keratinized with keratinized skin. Um, this is a particular problem in patients who may present with provoked vulvodynia. Um, somebody will say to them, yes, but the area looks red, and then they will get very worried about the redness, which is actually a completely normal variant. Um, vestibular papillae, these are often found, these are not warts. Um, they are a variation of normality that is seen in up to 50% of premenopausal women. Um, they don't need any treatment. They don't cause any symptoms. And then simple angiokeratomas, these little uh, hemangiomatous lesions with a keratinized surface, very common uh, in men and women. Um, and uh, again, completely normal, do not need treatment. But there are situations where patients may have no symptoms where they do need treatment. Uh, this is a patient that uh, thought she had warts, uh, but if you look very closely, there's this rather odd plaque uh, that's a bit irregular at the fourchette um, and biopsy of this showed uh, what we would have previously termed undifferentiated HPV related um, vulval intraepithelial neoplasia. The new terminology is now high grade squamous intraepithelial um, lesion or HSIL. And there are patients, it's a very small group, but there are, there are patients with lichen sclerosis who do not have any symptoms. Um, but these are still important to treat because, uh, as you will see here, this patient has developed quite significant scarring with loss of the uh, labia minora, sealing anteriorly, narrowing of the um, introitus, and this area of active lichen sclerosis. So this patient does need to be treated uh, with an ultrapotent topical steroid, as we will discuss later. Then there are patients who are very symptomatic, but when you look at the vulva, there is nothing to see. And the ma vast majority of these will have a vulval pain syndrome. These are neuropathic uh, problems termed vulvodynia. Um, but just make you aware that there are patients who can develop vulvodynia after an inflammatory dermatosis. So when I say there is nothing to see, what I mean is that there is nothing to see that would explain their symptoms. Um, and so the lichen sclerosis may be incredibly well controlled, they're not itchy, but they complain of pain. And uh, the simple way of looking at vulvodynia is the old classification uh, where the symptoms were generalized, but they're no provocation and localized. Localized provoked pain is still the commonest this used to be termed uh, vestibular dynia, um, but the latest classification of this 
is uh, of vulvodynia is vulval pain caused by a specific disorder. So clearly, if a patient has herpes, has a tumor, that would explain their pain. But when you look at the vulva and it's normal, that is most likely to be vulvodynia, which is a neuropathic problem. Um, and the symptoms can be localized, um, provoked, um, spontaneous or generalized affecting the whole vulva. And that is a completely separate uh, talk and I don't have time to go into that in more detail. So what I want to spend uh, more time on is um, the two big conditions that we see of lichen sclerosis and lichen planus. There are of course other inflammatory conditions like psoriasis, eczema, there are tumours, uh, there are pre-malignant lesions, um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to concentrate on the two conditions that are important because they're common um, and the, these ones you're likely to see. So lichen sclerosis is much more common in women than men. It specifically affects the anogenital genital skin. We don't know why, we know that it's not sexually transmitted, but it is a condition that specifically affects the vulva. And the two peaks of presentation are in girls, um, usually between the ages of three and five, and then in postmenopausal women. And if I just show you extragenital lichen sclerosis first, um, uh, you see that it has this white uh, sclerotic uh, change. Um, and one of the classic features of lichen sclerosis is this entity of e ecchymosis, which is very superficial bleeding into the upper layers of the skin. Um, and this is very characteristic, and I would say probably pathognomonic of uh, lichen sclerosis. So what are the symptoms? So the predominant symptom is itch. Patients will wake up at night scratching, but then soreness is also an issue because if the skin splits, this could be very painful. Uh, it may bleed and it can cause uh, pain with intercourse. In children, constipation is a very, very common symptom occurring in up to about 80%. Um, and that's often because they get perianal involvement with fissuring, um, which clearly uh, leads to a retention constipation and needs to be addressed as part of management. So then what do you see? So I'll show you several pictures that illustrate the effects and you really do need to see these features before you make the diagnosis. Um, certainly in the UK at the present time, I'm seeing a lot of patients who've been overdiagnosed and misdiagnosed as having lichen sclerosis where they don't have typical features. So you need to see this white symmetrical uh, sclerotic change. Uh, you can see here how th that the skin is quite thickened. And as things progress, there is often a loss of normal architecture. So you see this patient here, the labia minora are very uh, small and really mostly resorbed into the labia majora. And that clitoral hood that should be retractile is stuck down. In this patient, the labia minora are still present, um, but the clitoral hood here is much more thickened um, and again, stuck down. And this patient will, should not have problems with function, um, but it's important that uh, you treat this because obviously once treated, this scarring should stop. One of the other things that can happen is that patients will scratch and then they will develop these small erosions. Now, with this problem, this should resolve within a few days of the treatment with um, an ultrapotent topical steroid. If it doesn't, then you need to have a very low threshold for biopsy. But you see uh, this, again, white sclerotic change. And this, again, illustrates the change of ecchymosis, this uh, bruising in the skin, but also the change in anatomy. So the labia minora are very small, uh, there is uh, synechiae here anteriorly with sealing of the clitoral hood and narrowing of the entrance. And I think you can see here that there is a fissure um, 
and this patient will have problems with intercourse um, and may need expert management uh, to improve that. So this is a list of what should not be used to treat lichen sclerosis. Most of these now are historical, but topical testosterone has no benefit and there is no role for surgery in lichen sclerosis unless there is a tumour or there is such bad scarring that that needs to be um, treated. Because if you do surgery, this patient had a vulvectomy for benign disease, what happens is that the lichen sclerosis kerbnerizes in the scars and this patient has significant um, problems with function and ongoing symptoms, so she is no better. But there is a very good evidence base for the use of an ultrapotent topical steroid. We now have randomized controlled trials that show that this is better than calcineurin inhibitors. Um, and an ultrapotent topical steroid used correctly um, is extremely helpful. Um, the guidelines uh, that are the most recent are the 2018 uh, evidence-based uh, grade approved guidelines uh, that, are, that go into the management of lichen sclerosis in female, uh, females, men, and in children. And uh, there, this is the algorithm for uh, female um, lichen sclerosis. Um, you can see that these guidelines are all available for free on the BAD website. But I want to highlight this section here. Uh, there is a tendency to think, well, it may be lichen sclerosis, let's use Dermavate. But the problem is, if you're not confident of the diagnosis and you use Dermavate, that can reverse the histological changes and it can reverse uh, the clinical changes. And so you're never really sure if that has been the problem because Dermavate can treat lots of other things like lichen simplex, um, etc. So, what we recommend is that unless you are experienced in the management of lichen sclerosis and confident of the clinical diagnosis, that you don't start um, an ultrapotent steroid um, if you're going to refer the patient um, and certainly not to start that uh, without a biopsy. Um, if you are going to refer, you can treat the patient with a milder topical steroid as that will help their symptoms, but would not alter what we see um, in specialist clinics when we see these patients. So the treatment regime that we use is half fingertip unit of clobetasol propionate, 0.95% ointment, and every patient should have an induction regime of three months. So that's once a day for a month, alternate days for the second month, twice weekly for the third month, and then as needed to maintain control. And these patients should be seen by specialists until you have good control so that you can educate the patient as to how to manage their disease going forward. And then to move on to lichen planus, you will all be familiar with this uh, when it occurs on the skin. Um, but there are three main types uh, that affect the uh, anal genital skin. The classic type, um, the hypertrophic type, which is much less common, and the commonest type is erosive lichen planus, and there is a subtype of this, the vulvovaginal gingival syndrome, which has a specific genetic um, predisposition. Now, classic type lichen planus can be asymptomatic, and a small group, again, as, it, as with lichen sclerosis, the predominant symptom with lichen planus is soreness. And the big difference is that lichen planus can affect the vagina, lichen sclerosis never does. And uh, dyspareunia is a significant problem uh, in patients with lichen planus, and often they are unable to have intercourse at all. So classic type lichen planus, you will see these Wickham strii, um, in this network pattern, very similar to what you would see inside the mouth. Um, this will be itchy as it does on the skin. This can self-resolve even without treatment. But uh, the use of a potent steroid um, will settle this very quickly. Uh, it can affect the gingival margins and that will often give you a clue. Um, it may affect the perianal skin. Um, and it's always important to examine this, this area. Um, 
Now, hypertrophic lichen planus um, is uncommon, uh, mainly perianal, but the concern with hypertrophic lichen planus is the potential risk of developing a squamous cell carcinoma, and these patients do need to be followed up uh, carefully. Uh, you will see here, this can look similar to lichen sclerosis. Uh, this is pale, but this is pale because it's very thickened. Um, and these are features that are not typical of lichen uh, sclerosis. And a biopsy here is very helpful to give you the differential between the two. Now, erosive LP, this is an important condition. And I would suggest that erosive LP should be seen in the context of a specialised uh, multidisciplinary clinic um, because these patients do have significant functional problems. Uh, you see here this erosive change on the vulva. Uh, but the important thing here is that if this erosive change occurs inside the vagina, um, this can stick together very quickly and these patients uh, then will need surgery to open that. That can be prevented by good treatment. And again, you see this marked erosive gingival uh, change. But do take care. I hope you can see here this uh, eroded plaque, but it's very irregular. It's not symmetrical. And this is a patient with um, uh, high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, uh, undifferentiated VIN. And this is an important differential diagnosis um, of erosive lichen planus. Um, and uh, this would need a biopsy. Uh, you see, this is arising actually on a background of uh, lichen sclerosis. Now, the topical treatments that we use for lichen planus are uh, ultrapotent topical steroids in the same way as with lichen sclerosis. Um, but the vagina needs to be treated. And as dermatologists, if you're not um, uh, confident about treating a vaginal disease, then it's important to work with a gynecologist. Um, Foam preparations can be used, but the, there, is a, there are availability issues with these. So using a topical steroid on a dilator for vaginal uh, change uh, can be helpful. Calcineurin inhibitors, uh, tacrolimus and pimecrolimus are used, but they are not tolerated well um, and often will cause a lot of irritation. There is little evidence for the use of systemic uh, uh, agents, um, things like uh, phenylate, uh, hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate. Um, these are all used, but there's no evidence base for them. Um, they may help some patients. Just to finish off, uh, just to show you where lichen sclerosis and lichen planus are similar. They will both scar, they can both hyperpigment, they will both curtainize, there is a link with autoimmune disease. Um, there is a small risk of malignancy with both, and they both can develop vulvodynia after good treatment. Um, so lichen sclerosis can scar, lichen planus can scar, but you see this is erosive, this is sclerotic. They will both often develop hyperpigmentation. This is usually much more of an issue with lichen planus than lichen sclerosis, but it can occur. And the risk of malignancy uh, is probably about three to four percent. Actually, in patients with well-treated, well-managed disease, that risk is much, much lower. Uh, these are old figures now from the last century uh, that show these very high rates of malignancy. But in this term, leukoplakia, this should never be used these days because it's not diagnostic. And a lot of those patients probably had uh, pre-malignant disease. It does still happen. Uh, this is a patient with lichen sclerosis that presented with a squamous cell carcinoma in a background of untreated disease. And this is a patient with hypertrophic lichen planus, hypertrophic nodule of LP, big ulcerating squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and just to mention differentiated VIN, this is the non-HPV related type of pre-malignant disease. Uh, that's usually seen with lichen sclerosis and sometimes lichen planus. Uh, this is a patient who developed a, a squamous cell carcinoma, but you can see the surrounding change here of differentiated VIN. And the histology really just shows change at the basement membrane and is a very subtle histological diagnosis, so it needs an expert pathologist. 
and both can develop vulvodynia. So the main differences between lichen sclerosis and lichen planus, lichen sclerosis will occur in children. Uh, it's itchy, ecchymosis is common, and generally the response to treatment is good. But with lichen planus, very, rare, very, very rarely affects children. Soreness is the uh, major feature. There can be oral and vaginal involvement. Inflammation and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is more marked and treatment is more challenging. So in summary, um, with any patient that presents with vulval symptoms, a careful clinical evaluation, look at other sites because if you examine the mouth, that may well uh, point you towards lichen planus. A lot of these patients do need specialised management in um, expert uh, supervised clinics. And obviously work with your pathologist as clinical pathological correlation is vital. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry I'm not available to answer questions as this is recorded, uh, but I'm very happy for you to uh, email me um, and I, I will try and help. Many thanks.